Welcome to the Leadership in Law podcast with host Marilyn Jenkins. Cut through the noise, get actionable insights and inspiring stories delivered straight to your ears. Your ultimate podcast for navigating the ever-changing world of law firm ownership. In each episode, we dive deep into the critical topics that matter most to you, from unlocking explosive growth to building a thriving team. We connect you with successful firm leaders and industry experts who share their proven strategies and hard-won wisdom. So, whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting your journey as a law firm owner, the Leadership in Law podcast is here to equip you with the knowledge and tools you need to build a successful and fulfilling legal practice. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership in Law podcast. I'm your host, Marilyn Jenkins. Please join me in welcoming Sean Masterson. He's the senior attorney with Cohen and Ducey LLC and head of the Providence office. He's a founding partner of Shapiro Dory Masterson LLC. For the past 20 years, Sean's practice has concentrated on creditors' rights with a focus on residential mortgage defaults. Sean has also established a vibrant divorce and divorce mediation practice as a certified mediator. He has successfully res- resolved thousands of matters through alternative dispute resolution. Sean has successfully represented clients in the appellate courts throughout New England, including the First Circuit Court of Appeals and the Bankruptcy Appellate Panel. Believing that each attorney has a responsibility to make a positive contribution to his community, Sean provides pro bono legal services to domestic violence victims in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. I'm super excited to have you here, Sean. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks. Absolutely. I'm excited about the the different things that you're doing, and I was just wondering, can you tell us how you got started? Yeah, so it really is a divergence going from a, you know, when I started my practice as a creditor's rights attorney to going into, you know, I still do some of that work, but in really forging a practice area in divorce and divorce mediation, because normally those two worlds don't mix, all right? Right. Usually you'll see attorneys that, have different personalities, tend to migrate to certain types of law. But interesting, I spent my first 10 years with a firm that did solely creditors' rights throughout New England. So I was licensed in four states, five states now. And I did countless, because we were doing bankruptcy and foreclosure work, I did countless mediations in a foreclosure context Every single case was a matter of, we weren't necessarily litigating the cases. Our focus was try to, you know, get to a point where the, the borrower or the debtor could either make the, make the loan performing, or we could work a deal so we could take back the property and, and my client could move on. And then in 2013, myself and two of the attorneys at um, Sheckman Halpern Savage, where I started, decided to go off on our own. Because it was just a matter of, you know, freedom of running your own practice, the ability to secure your financial future. And when we started that, what we realized is that to do the same type of work that we were doing, this creditor's rights field, and to, you know, get clients that were institutional clients, we had to be a bigger firm. So we had to find niches in there to, to do it. And... Okay. Our practice, you know, when you're dealing with creditors' rights, particularly in the context of residential mortgages, residential foreclosures, residential bankruptcy, consumer bankruptcy, you do a lot with real estate. So right. every day there was always we were we were very familiar with title work. We were very familiar with transactional work because we would foreclose on our property and then it'd have to sell to a potential third buyer, a third party buyer. And so we decided that part of our new practice would be pursuing residential real estate transactional work. Okay. And that basically, for those who are unaware, you're working with mortgage companies, real estate agents to close mortgage loans on people who buy houses or people refinancing the mortgage on their houses. Right. Right. So that practice, in order to build that practice, you need to develop relationships with real estate agents, 
mortgage brokers, mortgage orig originators that are going to send you business. Okay. It's a very competitive field, right? Because it's, it's the type of law, we used to joke about it, it's the type of law that at the end of the transaction, when everybody's singing at the table at the closing, everybody's happy. Buyer's happy getting new house, seller's happy, they're moving on. The two real We're estate happy. agents are happy, they sold it right, made a commission. It, which is very different than a litigation in a foreclosure context or for that matter, in a divorce context. But in doing that, we started to see how do we build relationships with real estate agents, mortgage brokers? You know, we can do the networking events, we can go to the lunches, but everything's built on reciprocity. So how do I, if a mortgage broker or a real estate agent, you know, sends me a closing, how do I repay that? And you can't give them money, right? That, that violates RESPA and so forth. Right. But what we said, well, what if we had a mechanism where we could refer clients to them? Mm -hmm. And we had, in our first couple of years of, of doing the real estate stuff, we had a handful of clients that we were able to refer out, you know, friends and families that came to us and said, hey, we know you do real estate law. What do you think about this, or do you know a good realtor? I know you're in that, that world and we'd refer them out. And so it just dawned on me one day because we would deal with on the title side, we would have a, a number of files that had defects in title and the defects in title oftentimes were, were caused by a non real estate attorney grafting a deed or a conveyance as part of a divorce proceeding. And they. Mess oh, up. No. Nothing critical, nothing malpractice level, but stuff that required us to do an extra step on closing. And so it just said, well, wait a minute, if they're touching, if a divorce attorney is touching real estate and real estate transactional by virtue of the, the nature of their practice, what if we did divorce work? And of course, my well, two partners looked at me and said, you know, we're not cut out for that kind of work, but we think you are. So... <laughs> You know, so, so go at it. And, and so I, I kind of gravitated towards it because 99.9% .9 of divorce cases end in some type of settlement, right? You don't go to a trial. You don't necessarily want a judge making a decision in a divorce context most of the time. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. I've got this experience in settling cases in media. And I do it all the time in another context being real estate and foreclosure. I can do this divorce work. And so I started doing it in the first couple of cases came about, I, my, I think my second case was a referral from someone I knew from a, from a past business who had a relative that was a victim of severe domestic violence. Okay. And this person, I mean, it, it was, it was a pretty bad scene. And so that was a pro bono case. It, which led me to some resources with the Rhode Island Bar Association. They do a pro bono section for victims of domestic violence. So that's how I got involved in that. But as I went along in, in divorce, what I realized is that, you know, your litigation skills, like if you're a litigator right now and you're like, ah, you know, I, you know, I don't have enough litigation clients, maybe I should delve into family law. Your litigation skills really help you in divorce, even though you're not going to seek to litigate the case, but knowing what the steps are, having the ability to litigate oftentimes gives you a lot of credibility and confidence to go in and settle a case for your client. Okay. Um, and just as these things come about, I was seeing that, you know, gee, the overwhelming majority of my cases in the divorce world ended up settling. And there are certain cases, Marilyn, where, um, you have a couple that have been married for, let's say 15 years, they both have regular jobs, meaning they're getting a paycheck from somebody else and not self-employed. They have a house, maybe they have a couple of 401ks from a financial side, no one's hiding money because there isn't a vehicle to hide money, right? Their paycheck comes in, goes into the bank account, right? Yeah, maybe every week when they go to the grocery store, they're, you know, stuffing 10 bucks in the pocket, but that's not necessarily enough to say, well, gee, you know, there's some type of fraud here. And those cases, for all intents and purposes, would settle in, in a context of a 50-50 distribution. 
Okay, so Rhode Island and Massachusetts, for example, are an equitable di distribution state, meaning that a divorce court is going to look at the assets and divide it equitably. Like they look at a number of different factors, but in essence, it comes down to 50 50, right? Our job is more of making certain or trying to divide those assets equitably, meaning you know, if somebody is going to stay in the house for whatever reason, figuring out why they want to stay in the house, and maybe we have to move other assets around. Maybe you don't get a portion of retirement, but you keep the house or vice versa. So there's, it's more about how okay. we distribute it versus is it going to be 50-50 or something else? Okay. So in the context of, you know, doing that litigation, I'm like, you know, and for a lot of cases on a consumer level, Parties don't have twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars between the two of them to litigate a divorce case, right? True. And so, if we do spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars combined or more combined on a divorce case, you're eating away at whatever equity is in the house, or maybe there was the money that was going to go towards setting up maybe a college fund for the kids or what have you. So it just made sense to me, just on a level of sort of economic. Uh, expediency that why don't more people do mediation versus litigating the divorce cases? Okay. And, and again, there are certain cases where you maybe have to litigate. The person doesn't want to mediate or you know, maybe the person self-employed and they have five or six different sources of income and there's a concern that maybe they're hiding money. So yeah, that may take, take place in the context of a courtroom. But the but, average... But, the average overwhelming majority, you, you really shouldn't be litigating this stuff because you may be right, but are you want to spend your child's inheritance to be right? Or do you want to say, listen, I think he may be hiding assets, but at most, maybe he's hiding $5,000. Do I want to spend 10000 in legal fees to figure that out? Yeah. Right. And come up with the negative answer. So for a number of different reasons, mediation seems like the most equitable and viable way to dissolve a marriage with dignity, mm -hmm. right? Because you're sitting at a table or over Zoom and you're having a conversation, you know, with the mediators, you know, third party, in, you know, a non-interested third party facilitating this conversation and the parties can communicate back and forth about, you know, who wants to keep the house? Well, why do you want to keep the house? You know, what's more important to you? You know, why is it that, you know, you know, securing your retirement is important to you? Because maybe there's a reason behind it. We understand those reasons and we're able to craft a settlement that both sides agree to, right? We don't leave it to a judge to make a decision, right? And at the end of the day, we're still getting, again, 99% of the time, we're still getting to that 50-50 split. It's right. just, we're cutting out all the, you know, all of the, you know, part of my French, all the crap to get to 50, 50, right. And it's a lot less money for both parties. Both parties still have an opportunity to talk to counsel individually to make sure their rights are protected. But it just, it, it, that, that's kind of led me, what led me to mediation because my educational background is in economics. I have a bachelor's and a master's in economics. And I always think in terms of sort of a supply and demand. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever I'm looking at a conflict, you know, it's applying to me. You want something that I have. At some point, we're going to hit an equilibrium point in the middle. Right. right? And, and I think all those, those why questions get down to the point of it. You know, in, in lots of contexts, we have five levels of why to find out really. And does it come down? It's because I just don't want her to have the house or, you know, is there another reason behind it? I think having a third party and asking those why questions are get to the point and with the, all the parties involved, definitely, you know, you can find, a, a, like you said, an equilibrium. Right, right. So that's what led me to, led me to do a more and more mediation. And so now building, you know, when we're talking about marketing, building the real estate side for 10 years, that real estate transaction, which I got out of a couple of years ago, one of my partners kind of took that over. I spent 10 years building that, but building that on relationships, sort of like one-to-one -one relationships. Okay. Because I know that a real estate agent may have 
20 transactions a year that they could send to us. Or a mortgage broker may have 20, 30 transactions a year they could send to us, right? Every year, right? Right. So I could spend my time building a relationship with a handful of people and knowing that there's a good chance that those handful are each going to contribute a little towards, you know, sending us referrals. When you get to more of the consumer, like in a family law divorce mediation context, there's really not a single feeder, right? It's, okay. I, I mean, I can't, you know, th there's, there's a ton of, you know, maybe there is a, you know, marriage counselor type person you could go to, but those folks are geared towards trying to maintain the marriage, not necessarily right. getting a divorce, right? So they're maybe less inclined to uh, refer out to, to divorce attorneys. So social media... I think is as I'm taking my small practice to move it to more of a online divorce mediation type practice mm -hmm. where I can service people really throughout the country, right? Mediators for the most part don't need to be attorneys, right? So I don't need a, a law right. license in, let's say California to do a mediation there. I just have to be cognizant of you know, what the, what the laws are in California. How do I build relationships with the general public? Right. And right. I think that's where, that's where sort of, as I'm moving into maybe using YouTube, podcasting, social media is creating a, a personal brand and that brand helps build relationships with, um, a number of people. Well, that's true. Social media is a great outlet for getting your your brand out there for for family law, B two C specifically, but family law because there's so many aspects of family law, and you know people are surfing the web, they're on Google, all of these different things, whatever's going on in their life, and they keep seeing you, and you're reminding them of something they're thinking about. It's a great way of getting personal branding out there for that. I agree. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, you know, the idea came to me of doing more podcasts and YouTube. And as I'm building my, my YouTube, I do a lot of, a lot of running. And so, I don't know, maybe a couple, three years ago, I just started going on YouTube looking for, running. I think maybe something had popped up, not even looking for it. And so I follow a couple of three YouTubers that deal with running, marathon running, ultra running. Right. Okay. And they do right. video on a very regular basis. And after you watch it for a couple of years, it's almost as if you know them, right? So they'll they'll That's right. They'll show a video of them preparing for a race or in a race. And you find yourself like, hey, I'm rooting for this guy. Right. Right. I don't know him from a hole in the wall other than what I see on YouTube, but it's as if I had built a relationship with this person. It's the no like and trust factor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for a lot of attorneys. There, there's not a lot of attorneys that go and use YouTube or, you know, there's a lot to do podcasts, but to really build a brand, particularly if you want to build it on a, if you, if you're in a large state or, or you can build it regionally or nationally, I don't see it an easier vehicle than, you know, like a YouTube or, you know, Facebook or something like that. Right. Now, are you using LinkedIn? Are you growing your LinkedIn with the videos as well? Or you're staying with the more to B2C platforms like YouTube? Yes. Yeah, so, so LinkedIn has been more of a um, business to business, yeah. right? So on the, on my, when I put my other hat on and I'm doing sort of the creditor's rights litigation stuff, the LinkedIn is, is where, it, is where it's at right now, right? So. You know, there's relationships that we have with other attorneys, or maybe there's a post on LinkedIn that indicates something going on in the commercial lending side where someone's going to see and, and think of us, but not necessarily for the consumer side. I, th I just think, and I may be wrong, but no, no, I no, think- we're thinking the same thing. You yeah, wanna, LinkedIn is not necessarily the consumer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. I can put a very different message on- you know, a Facebook or a YouTube. Mm -hmm. And are you, podcast. yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And podcasting is going to be your B2B and, and B2C. Podcasting seems to cover the, the gamut of the audience. Are you working with any local, um, say, nonprofits or something to 
help with the domestic my, the domestic violence outreach that you're doing pro bono? How often do you do that? Yeah. Do so you- yeah. So we we or I, as part of that part, it's called Partners Against Domestic Violence. I usually take about one case a year from them. Okay. And then inevitably we'll pick up another pro bono case. Usually, usually a, a direct referral from somebody that I know. Okay. Maybe another, you know, another attorney or a, a friend or something like that will say, hey, listen, there's someone you know, in my office that has an issue, domestic violence or whatever. Because oftentimes, you know, domestic violence, you know, really th- there's no necessarily socioeconomic sure. dividing line, right? But what happens is it tends to affect people who have a lower economic resources. Whether that's because, you know, their, their spouse cuts them off, you know, because they're, they're manipulated and, you know, the spouse is the one that's out earning the income. Right. They're at home taking care of the house, taking care of the kids or whatever. And then the spouse says, well, I'm cutting you off. And you don't have access to money. I mean, it's amazing how many of these clients will come in. And part of any divorce filing, any mediation is the one of the first steps is you know, domestic violence, are you safe? You know, get to a safe place. But as we start to get into the case, one of the first steps is, okay, let's look at the finances. Mm-hmm. We're going to divide them up. How are you going to survive this? That, the other thing. And it's amazing how many of these folks have no visibility okay. or have very little disability or, you know, they're like, well, the last 20 years, I've worked part time in my entire life goes to my husband and he controls everything. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, or I, they say, I don't have any skills. I What am I going to do? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Or I tried to go back to work, you know, 10 years ago. And um, you know, he said, the husband, and most times, you know, it goes both ways. But predominantly what I've seen in my practice is the husband being the abuser. I see it both ways. But oftentimes it's the husband. And that was yeah. just a matter of it's a matter of control, but they don't have access to funds. So that's why they'll, you know, come to me, we'll, we'll help them, you know, through the process. And, you know, we've had a a lot of success in that and just on sort of a selfish note, when you have a practice that for, you know, 20 years I've been involved in foreclosure bankruptcy, where I represent the creditor and I see, you know, quote unquote, a win for me or my client is taking possession of the house, right? Which means on the other side, unfortunately, someone, someone is lost. losing their home, right? Right. Um, so you don't feel like a superhero when you, hey, I've got a win for my client, but I'm not a superhero because someone is out of a house, right? Someone is struggling to find new, new housing. Whereas on, you know, some of these pro bono cases that we do, you know, I, I think part of me takes it selfishly. It's not an act of kindness. It's really an act of selfishness for me because I feel good about myself after, right? You see someone that's like, oh, now I have freedom. Oh, I didn't realize that I could have a life away from this person who is dominated and manipulated and controlled me for 10, 15, 20 years, right? So right. seeing them succeed and be happy really is, you know, r- really is something I, I take on. I take pride in, but it really, it makes me feel good. So sometimes I take them not because I'm generous. It's because I'm selfish. I want to feel good, but it, it, it's an incredible way, you know, for, for a lot of attorneys out there, there's some states I've realized that have requirements for going to work mm-hmm. and it, within those states, some of the big firms will have one or two people that only do pro bono work to kind of satisfy the requirement for the firm. But if you're a solo practitioner, you're in a small firm and it's difficult to take a pro bono case because you, you know, the, the, you need to billable out to make a living, right? You got to yeah. billable out, you got to make a living, but it really is rewarding to take a pro bono case. It, it really, mm-hmm. it really is. You're, you're helping someone and you're using your, you're using your resources in your gift, right? To be a lawyer, right? It's, you know, you earned it, but you know, you're. You're gifted, right? You're gifted with the intelligence to be able to go to college and go to law school. You're gifted with the ability to succeed and get through law school and pass the bar exam. Right. Um, good way to, you know, good way to, to give back, right? So 
you know, I, I see it, you know, my wife's a physician, so, you know, every day she's doing, you know, these acts of kindness just in her general practice as a physician, as all physicians do. As lawyers, we don't necessarily get to do that all the time. Sometimes doing that pro bono is a nice little, hey, I feel good about myself. I did something good, right? right. So all those memes on Facebook about the lawyers, you know, <laughs> the big bad lawyers and the lawyer jokes, right? And kind of back to counterbalances that a little bit. Huh. Well, that's good. Right. It's real, real good to be able to help people like that. I mean, you're you're making a living. You're giving giving back, and you're helping people on both sides of the table. And then it all kind of circles back around to the real estate stuff that you were doing. If someone's in the middle of divorce and, and neither want the house or however, or even one keeps the house, someone else needs a place to live. So, you know, you can help with your network of putting the whole world together in two different, two different worlds together. And you can just, yeah. I mean, that's like, what's the old saying? Not every superhero was, wears a cape. You yeah. know, you get to go at the end of the day, realizing well, how much you've done. Yeah. I, I don't want to be on record as saying lawyers are superheroes, but uh, let's feel times to, you know, to help someone. Right. So it's not like, okay, I had a client, I won, you know, I won and we got a settlement. It's you, you, you're helping someone, they're walking away happy. Right. And, you know, divorce is divorce work is, is difficult, right? Because you're dealing with difficult situations. And I, I, I tell people all the time, like what, what, you know, what is it about your clients? Like, how would a client describe the process? And inevitably, clients will come to me in the early stages, right? They just, maybe their spouse filed first and they're coming to me or they're about to file. And Marilyn, you can see on their face, in their body language, the frustration, the stress, the anxiety, okay? Mm -hmm. And see it. And it impacts their physical health. It impacts their psychological health. It impacts their earning ability, particularly if they're someone that's self-employed. They're in right. sale, they're self-employed. If they don't wake up feeling good and positive, it's very difficult to go out there and sell or to run your own shop when you're just, you're not up to it psychologically. So I see clients and then through the process, they get better. They get better, right? Because everyone comes, well, not everyone, but most people come into it. Like, I don't know what, what's going to happen. I don't know the process. Right. I don't know long, how, I don't know how long it takes. How am I going to survive? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, my spouse is threatening to, you know, take the kids full custody and I have to, you know, counsel these folks. I'm like, that, that's not going to happen, right? It's very rare that that, that happens. But you see, as we go the process, as you start to break it down and here's the strategy, here's how long it's going to take. Here's what we're looking at from a reality standpoint. Here's a way through mediation. We can resolve this without it costing you $30,000, mm -hmm. right? And you see the people, each step, they look better. Yeah. They start to carry themselves a little better. They get a little bit of confidence. And I have clients that will come back you know, maybe it's like for, in Rhode Island, for example, we have a, you know, whether it's mediation or litigation, you have to have a hearing and it takes 90 days after that hearing for it to be filed. So oftentimes I'll have a client that will come back at that 90 day mark to get a copy of, you know, I can mail it to them, but they'll come in to get a copy of the final judgment, or maybe they need to sign off on the deed, right? We train them to sign off on it. And, and you see them 90 days after and you can tell it's like, oh my God. Like you're a different person than you were, you know, nine months ago or a year ago when you came into my office and they'll say, yeah, I never thought that I could be free or I never thought I could get a fresh yeah. start. Right. I didn't realize how unhappy I was until I started being happy now that I'm in this new life. Right. Well, so, yeah. You don't realize how unhappy you are is it because it's a gradual thing. And then all of a sudden it's 90 days. It's like, oh my God, it's a new lease on life. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it is yeah. rewarding. I know, I know there's a lot of, like my, like I said at the beginning, my partners are like, yeah, we're not doing that. We don't have the personality to do family law work. So guess what? Right. I, I think it, it is, you know, for, you know, attorney, particularly attorneys, you're starting to go off on your own and trying to build that practice in different practice areas. You know, family law is a, 
it really is a, a rewarding area of the law. It can be frustrating. Hmm. You have to be able to take phone calls on the weekends, phone calls after hours, right? Because again, it's a consumer-based law. Well, these people are working nine to five. So when they need to reach right. you after five o'clock, it's after six o'clock. So you got to be willing to do that. But I think on balance, on balance, it's a very positive area of law and practice. Okay. Well, that's very good to know because people come in and I've talked to attorneys that, that niched right out of law school and we're super happy about it. And then attorneys that, you know, worked in a generalist firm and then later in life niched down. And then, so, you know, it's, it's seeing that, that journey, what's that journey for you and, and finding something that you really enjoy that, you know, that lights you up. Obviously you like being able to help people and seeing the outcome and, and the mediation instead of the, the litigation work for you. So that, that's very good to, to, to tell people, you know, we love to hear stories of what other people are doing. How do you keep yourself in, in those times where maybe motivation might be an issue and you're kind of bogged down and you have to come back fresh on the next mediation session? How do you keep yourself excited and, and inspired and motivated, inspired and motivated? Yeah, I don't know. That where running comes in? Is that something that keeps it's, it clear in your mind? I mean, that, that kind of helps me. I, no, that, that's, that's a good question, you know, cause I, I do, I do run, you know, just about every day, knock on wood. It, it, I don't know. It's almost like you have to have a separation. Yeah. Right. Each case is different. And sometimes you have to take a deep breath when you walk out, but you know, since, you know, let's say 2000 or nine. I don't want to say the year because people are going to realize how old I am, but 1994, <laughs> right? When I started graduate school, because I had my graduate degree, I worked full time and went to graduate school. So I always had to have that shift between, okay, here's my work mode. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to shift. Now I've got to go sit in a classroom. Now I've got to go study, right? So I think early on I, in my professional career, I learned how to do that shift, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of that mindset shift. Right. Yeah. I because call it I, compartmentalizing, but yeah, same thing. Yeah. But, yeah. And that carry over as I, you know, cause I was running hotels when I was going to graduate school, law school. So I'd have a, you know, a busy day. And when I'm sitting in a classroom, I'm doing something totally different than what I'm doing there today. And right. you have to focus. Yeah. So you have to put it, you have to do that separation. So I think I just, I just sort of developed that just that mindset or the ability to car compartmentalize what I was doing and just the realization that it's not, it's not fair to your client. Like if you have a, if you have a bad client experience, let's say in the morning you're in, in one court and it's just a, it's just a bad outcome, bad experience, whatever, high stress. And that's going to get anybody stressed and down, but then you have to jump to another hearing or mediation or something, client meeting, it, it really does a disservice to the other client if you continue mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of dwell on it. So it really is just being aware of, you know, what's going on. But I, I think overall at the end of the week, uh, you gotta have, you gotta have some type of outlet that, you know, whether it's yeah. being outside or whether it's being with the family, whether it's, you know, sitting alone, watching television for a couple of hours, just to veg out and, you know, yeah. totally separate from, from the world. There's gotta be something because it, it is, it is relatively, you know, high stress. Yeah. Well, I know that you say that, that, uh, you, you run every day and that's obviously very therapeutic. What are the, what are other helpful resources that's helped you along the way to get to where you are and, and, you know, in life as well, you know, your mental life as well as in helping your clients? Because obviously economics being having your degree, you, you've got the numbers as, as part of what you are. You know, I'm just, I'm seeing the big picture here, but if someone else were to say, okay, how could I do something like that? What kind of resources helped you that maybe can help someone else? Yeah, I think you talk about how I went off on my own, my own practice. Well, I'm thinking about as you've grown and, you know, you took your, your, the positives of, of the working with the debt and the mortgages and that sort of thing and the mediation took all of those. Are there, is there a specific book that you've read that makes you, you know, just, is there something that we can say, okay, if you want to go off and do this, you know, your mindset needs to be set like this and, 
you know, think about how you can help outside sources, you know, with your cases. So everything kind of revolves in together and everybody wins. That probably didn't make sense of the question. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I, I get, you know, I think I read a lot. Okay. And I've, I, you know, is there one book, you know, I think there's a book, I'm forgetting the author right now, but two professors out of Harvard writ, wrote a book about mediation and negotiation titled Getting to Yes. That was from a mediation standpoint, that was probably one of the best books. And I think I, I was just listening to a podcast the other day. It was talking about negotiation. They brought up that book, right? So I think that's right. the fundamental. I've heard if it you're a lawyer, Yeah. If, if you're a lawyer, if you're doing any type of negotiation, whether it's in sale, you know, read that book, right? And I think, yeah. I think I remember it was from a book I'm reading now by Charles Duhigg called, what do you call it? It's, communi it's about communication, super communicators or communication. Mm -hmm. It's his newest book. And he brings okay. that up. He brings that book up. But what I found is that in law school, undergraduate, graduate school, law school, you, at least at where I, my schooling, you, you didn't have a lot of classes in education on the how-tos, mm -hmm. right? That the how-tos come from experience. They come from outside reading. So I've gotten it. I mean, the podcast, I wish podcasts existed, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, exactly. I, because I think I'd be much better off. And I think, you know, young folks that are coming out just starting out now with all the resources with podcasts, YouTube, there's more and more books that are written in all aspects of whether it be psychology, communication, negotiation, you know, marketing across the board is much more than it was back you know, when I was, when I was coming up. Uh, right. I mean, there's, right. that's right. And we can hear so many stories and so much advice and learn from so many different people. Thanks to podcasts and YouTube. Yeah. And I think, I think it's been, just been a combination of, you know, just listening to, you know, audio books. You know, I was on my, in my old practice, because we had a regional practice, I was on the road a lot going towards throughout. And then I, f I forget what it was, what year it was, but Audible started to come out. Right. right. We had books on tape. And before that, you'd have to buy a cassette or a CD and you put it in the car thing. Those were awful. Or you rent them from the local video store, right? Yeah. That's what I did when I was traveling. <laughs> but then, you know, Audible came out and I had a car that, I don't know what year it was, but it, it was like the first time I had Bluetooth in the car. And so I could go from, my, get on my phone played on the Bluetooth in the car and I could listen to, you know, I'd have a two hour trip to, you know, from Providence to, you know, Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, I could listen to a book on tape, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'd focus on, you know, business oriented, right? Cause I was like, Hey, it, it, it's a work day. I'm in my car, right? right. Work. L let me focus on a work thing instead of listening to sports radio. Right. Right. Particularly as Depending I'm doing what's to happening to yeah, I mean, it really, you know, when I was driving in towards Connecticut and I started to get the New York stations, I didn't want to hear about the Yankees and the Giants. So I would, <laughs> I could turn sports radio off, right? And I could, you know, listen to these business books. It just made sense, you know, sort of work day. And then podcasts came out. It was sort of the same thing as you could say, wow, hey, I read this book by X author. Well, now, and it's interesting to see what they have to talk about what guests that they have, what books that they recommend. Because I think, I want to say in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, I think that I've read, you know, business oriented book, I've gotten the, the inspiration, if you will, to read that book from a podcast. You know, yeah, you listen to, the, hey, you know, Joe Rogan experience and he has on X author and they're talking about their book. You're like, oh, that sounds interesting. I should get that book. Or listen to it on tape, right? And then there's a couple of books right. we listen to on tape. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a lot of detail. I better get the book. I've got probably, you know, a bunch of those where I had to go out and buy the book after the podcast. So, you know, the resources that I use, those resources, I've never really had a mentor in the, in the legal business. The way my first firm was set up, there was no mentor system. 
Um, which looking back now, I wish, I wish that I had that, you know, the first firm that I worked with was more of a, you know, assembly line factory firm, you know, right. doing stuff that wasn't overly complicated. Um, the concern at that firm wasn't developing your abilities as an attorney. The concern at that firm was making sure that you got to court on time and sign the documents, right? Cause oh, it wasn't, right. you know, it wasn't overly complicated and you were doing basically the same general thing each file. So, you know, after a while it's fairly easy to pick up, but I would say if you're a young attorney, I, I would seek out a mentor, right? Cause there's a lot of attorneys, mm -hmm. e even if like, you know, you're solo or you're a small practice and you're, you know, you got a, a partnership where in my, my last firm that we started, you know, one of my partners was doing all of the transactional work, right? So I was going out marketing for it. He would actually do the physical work. He was learning, right? We didn't have a mentor. We end up talking to an attorney that refers us to another attorney who's like, oh yeah, you should call Dave because Dave's very good at this area of these closings. It had to be a Connecticut issue. And then through that, particularly my partner, developed a good relationship. And he was the same age, but he had been doing that type of work for a little bit longer and mm -hmm. sort of acts as a mentor, right? Someone that you can call to say, I've got this issue. I don't know what to do. Having a mentor is going to help. Yeah, I mean, those... shared experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes yes. those mentors and, too. You know, you... Can be, you know, those mentors, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Marilyn, but I, I think the mentors too, as a lawyer, you know, obviously other lawyers, but mm -hmm. oftentimes mm -hmm. there's other people, particularly if you're running a practice, right? You're running it off if you're running a practice. Other professionals can act as mentors in, in the sense of maybe it's just from a marketing standpoint, mm -hmm. what lawyers tend not to realize is that they're sales, right? If you run your own practice, welcome to the jungle. You're sales. Exactly. You're a sales. Right. They don't realize that, right? Cause they'll look, oh, I'm not a sales guy. I'm a lawyer. Well, you're a sales guy. But so sometimes having through, through your network, a mentor, at least someone you can just, you know, bounce ideas off of that's a marketing person or, you know, in our practice, when we went off on our own, our landlord, when we rented, we then bought the building from him. Our landlord was a ortho, was a oral surgeon. He had his okay. practice down the street from where our building was. He owned that building, he owned our building. Nicest guy in the world. And, you know, he'd stop by and we just, you know, just talk for, you know, 10, 15 minutes about business, right? I mean, obviously being a dentist and doing the, the, the medical stuff is very different from a lawyer, but running the office, a lot of similar issues, dealing with sure. clients, dealing with referrals, dealing with employee stuff. So sometimes it's, Hey, I don't really have a lawyer. I kind of know the area of law that I'm in. I've done it for you know, five, six, seven years at this firm. I'm comfortable with how to do it. How do I run the practice? Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult if you're working, if you're a young attorney, you work with somebody and then you say, oh, okay, well, you've trained me for the last five or six years. I'm now going to go start a firm across the street doing the same thing. Will you be my mentor? Right. <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's, it's a difficult decision. I would say like if that former boss is a good person with vision, he will be your mentor, right? Because it's yeah. the, the pie is not limited. So I, I think resources, your books, your podcast, your, you know, every attorney who's running their own firm should be in some type of networking group, you know, whether it's a yeah. you know, BNI type business networking. And in those networking groups is all kinds of professionals, right? Some that are going right. to send you business, some that won't, but there's going to be people who have insight in how to do yeah. And I thought, so, I always found the Chamber of Commerce the same thing. In the Chamber of Commerce, you've got businesses of all sizes, all types. And, you know, you can not only have I met some of my best friends in life for my, my chambers and, and B&I type networking events, but 
you learn so much more because they've been in other experiences that may or may not touch you at some point. But could always be learning, I guess, is, is the thing. Always be looking for something new to learn. And I love that you're feeding your mind as you're, you know, doing your podcast. I mean, doing your running or, or doing your trips. You know, I do the same thing. It's like it, a lot of the times it's not a toss up to listen to music or a podcast. There's so many interesting things out there to listen to. So, I mean, this is this has been great. I loved hearing your journey. And gosh, thank you so much for your time. Where where can our listeners connect with you and, and reach out to you if they have any questions? Yeah, so Cone. I would for YouTube, yeah. Yeah, well, YouTube is in, YouTube is going to launch in about a month. And the podcast is going to launch in about a month called Divorced in Reality. Right. Okay, so uh, just issues. for those who aren't listening to it right now, this is, means you're going to be launching in early September 2024? Really yeah. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. Divorced in Reality. But they can reach me, you know, my email s masterson at coneinducy dot com. Cohen C O H N and A N D D U C D U S S I dot com. You know, shoot me an email. Always willing to help. You know, insight. I mean, even you know, and I will say this too about you know resources, mentors. My competitors have been some of my better referral sources. Really? No, oh, I better referral sources just because they, they end up having conflicts. They get they're conflicted out of something. Cool. I, I've, I've got a quick story. When I was practicing in my old firm, did a lot of bankruptcy work in Vermont. Vermont has not a very big bankruptcy bar. When I started, one of the sort of leaders, if you will, of the debtor, and I'm a creditor of the debtor's bar you know, welcomed me in and she said, yeah, it's like, you know, welcome. You know, there's now 14 members of the bankruptcy bar in, in Vermont, right? And I thought, what's oh, 14? Like usually, you know, there's you know, 1,400 in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and literally there was 14, right? Um, but I can remember because they all knew that I traveled up from Providence to go to Vermont. And it's, you know, four hour drive at times. And I would have them all the time. They would say, hey, listen, if you're coming in, you got an early morning here, why don't you just come up? You can, st we got an extra bedroom. You can stay at our place. Or oh. I was up there once it was snowing and I, I had to get back, but I had a couple of people, I'm going to say, don't drive in the snow, stay at my house. Right. I mean, there was, there was very, when we're in the courtroom, we're adversarial, right? They're not giving yeah. anything. There's no reason why you have to be adversarial outside of that. And, you know, I've referred stuff to them. They've referred stuff to me and, and. You think that they're the enemy, but you know, this, they can be some of your best referral sources. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about sharing your YouTube channel and your upcoming podcast, Divorced from Reality. Is that what Divorced you said? Divorced in Reality. Divorced in Reality. We're going to make sure that that's in the show notes as well as your YouTube channel. We'll get all that updated. So no matter when you're listening to this uh, podcast, it's going to, those two things are going to be launching in early September, 2024. Make sure you look for Sean there. And any last comments? I'm, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today and what you shared. No, I did too. I mean, it's always interesting to, uh, I, I look forward to listening to more of your podcasts and see what other folks are doing. Absolutely. But yeah, I just say, you know, like being a lawyer is highly stressful. It can be rewarding in other ways other than money, but you know, just, you know, when you want to be a leader in the law, you just, you just got to be out there, you know, just be out there. Always, always trying to either learn something new, talk to people, um, you know, don't be shy about getting to court, get off this. If you can elect to go to court versus zoom here and go to court. Yeah. Right. You're going to learn more. You're going to meet more people and you'll be better off for it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sean. This is, Marilyn, this has been you. great. I appreciated your time. And again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks, Marilyn. Thanks for joining me today for this episode. As we wrap up, I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to discover this podcast. Second, you can connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm currently learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take the next step with a digital strategist to help you grow your law firm, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to lawmarketingzone.com to book a call with me. Stay tuned for our next episode next week. 
Until then, as always, thanks for listening to Leadership in Law podcast, and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Leadership in Law podcast. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. There's a whole community of law firm owners out there facing similar challenges and striving for the same success. Head over to our website at lawmarketingzone.com. From there, connect with other listeners, access valuable resources, and stay up to date on the latest episodes. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, keep leading with vision and keep growing your firm.